Good evening, mate. Are you well? I'm not. I'm not too bad. What's that? I'm hot and I know it. Lift it up yes. slightly. Go up slightly. There. Now th down a bit. Down. There it is. Yes. There we go. Yeah. It's um. Yeah. It's a. Uh, it's a Rocky Horror Show one, isn't it? Um. No, actually, is it's it? um from uh, these people. Oh. Um, okay. Are we done? Are we, being, are we are brought to you by fuck.com. Um, yeah, it came in a goodie bag when I was at a conference a while back. And yeah, it's just, um, yeah. Well, I'm you very impressed really because I, I remember looking up fuck.com when we were just buying domain names before any websites were out. And that thing was like hundreds of thousands of pounds. So um, that's, a, yeah. that's a very expensive domain name, that. Um, yeah, well, they make lovely mugs. Um, and we, there yeah. we go. That's a free, free advertising for them there as well. Just so the lovely that I would algorithm. hit the like button straight away if I were you. Yeah, I would hit that Absolutely. like button. Yeah. Absolutely. For, 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 for us advertising odd products, we are available to sell our souls. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, yeah. sell anything. Yeah, I would. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So anyway, welcome back. Uh, thanks for all the likes. Thanks for all the subscriptions. I have noticed that we have gone over the threshold of 25 recently. Six, I saw today. 26 subscriptions, 26. Um, which means that I will be purchasing some free Kindle codes um, to for, of my book, Blood Ink, which he said looking up there and thinking he had a copy close. I do. Of my several bookshelves that I have going on. Blood ink, blood ink. There we go. Written by myself. I will um, get some uh, Kindle links for this. Um, what should I do? Should I get five Kindle links? Do you reckon? Um, yeah, I've got I've got um, audio book links for um, a couple of my titles. So yeah, if anybody okay. wants to listen to my dulcet tones reading my dulcet books, in that case, yes, I will. Brilliant. Um, and that well, we'll do, I'll tell you what, we'll do yours when we hit 30. All right. Okay. And this one, I'm going to ask people uh, right early on, uh, look up books by Colin Davis on Facebook and send me a direct message to say that you were watching this video. And the first five people to do that, I will send them a link to a free Kindle book where they can get that for free. How's that? There we go. Brilliant. It's weird. I've done a performance recently and I was waiting for a round of applause then. It's not going to happen. So. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Right. So let's get down to the business of the, the rocking horse winner. Ash, over to you. Rocking horse winner. Um, so, yeah, the um, story begins with the description of Hester, who has trouble loving her three children. Not in that way. Hester feels unlucky because her family is running out of money, but she cares a great deal about appearing to be wealthy. The house seems to constantly whisper, there must be more money. And Paul, Hester's young son in particular, becomes concerned about the family's financial situation. When he asks his mother why they don't have enough money, she explains to them, to him, that they are unlucky and that luck is the reason people are rich. Paul claims that he is lucky, but his mother doesn't believe him. So he becomes determined to prove his luck to her. Paul obsessively and furiously starts riding his rocking horse because he believes it can take him to look, a habit he keeps secret from everyone else. He also talks with Bassett, the family's gardener, about horse racing and places bets on the races whenever he knows who will win. Paul's uncle Oscar finds out about Paul's betting and begins betting based on Paul's recommendations, which are always correct. Paul makes an extraordinarily large amount of money, but he also becomes increasingly increasingly anxious and intense. Uncle Oscar helps Paul give some money to his mother anonymously, but the money only makes the whispering in the house worse. Instead of using it to pay off debts, Hester buys new furniture and invests in sending Paul to an elite school. Paul is more determined than ever to make the whispering stop and he refuses to stop riding his rocking horse even when his mother, oops, even when his mother suggests that he is too old for the toy. The derby's coming up and Paul is obsessed with picking the winner. One night while at a party, Hester is overwhelmed with anxiety about Paul. She calls the nurse to see how he's doing, but when the nurse offers to check on him in his room, Hester decides not to bother him until she gets home. When she finally arrives at his room, she hears a familiar yet violent noise coming from behind the door. 
Paul is riding his rocking horse so hard that he and the horse are lit up in a strange night. He announces in a deep voice, it's Malabar, and then collapses to the floor. Days later, Paul is very ill. Bassett tells Paul that Malabar won the derby, and Paul now has £80,000. Paul is very excited to be able to prove to his mother that he is, in fact, lucky. But that night, Paul dies. Uncle Oscar suggests that Hester is better off having £80,000 instead of a strange son, but that Paul is also better off dead than living in a state where he rides his rocking horse to find the winner. Very good. What do you think to it then? I know that one was my choice. Uh, yes, this one was your choice. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I actually found it quite funny, uh, even though it's incredibly tragic. Just the, um, just the, the image of this child frantically riding his rocking horse to find the winners is actually a really bizarre image in my head. I thought it was quite funny because I had him in my head. I've got him on one of those traditional rocking horses with the bowed wooden yeah. you know, things underneath. So you get that rocking motion. Well, I think in the 1950s, they made a movie, in, oh, 1940s, actually, I think they made a movie of the rocking horse winner. And they kind of use one that's on, on a swing almost. Which I right. think has the same, the same action as just that rocking, like you know, really bouncing, bouncing the thing around. But yeah, I, I did, en- I really enjoyed it. I thought the writing style was excellent, and um, and I thought that we, there's a lot of stuff we can sort of go into. I like that. It it was so like an episode of the Twilight Zone in the way yes. that it was written. It kind of unfolds like that. <clears throat> um, it does doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I love about um, D.H. Lawrence is that he's got the same initials as one of my favourite parcel delivery firms. Um, and I think that's something that people um, tend to overlook. Um, not and my love... favourite delivery service. The... I, can, I can tell you that. No, they're not, are they? You no. were really, really pissed off with D.H.L. the other week. Yes. Yes. And still are, I imagine. Oh, yeah. yes. Very annoyed yeah. by them, you know. Anyway... Um, Yes, um, and with this one, um, I like the fact that money is placed at the forefront of what's important to people um, because it fulfills this whole capitalist ethos that we're all meant to buy into. And the fact that we've got um, the child being made anxious by the mother's need for money. Uh, We're told straight away that the mother doesn't even love these kids, which, what a heartless bitch. Well, actually, there was a really interesting part in all of that, I thought. Um, in that the way that he described it was very much like postnatal depression or postnatal psychosis, actually, which a friend of mine suffered from many years back. And that does lead to those kind of, you know, everything about her. She's shopping therapy. You know, she's yeah. incredibly mentally ill um, from, from childbirth. You don't know which it could have actually been from the last one because you, you never really understand in which order the kids really are in that respect. But um, yeah, it's it's a it's a quite uh, it's it's one of those things where it's not common, but there's a lot of people suffer from it because there's a lot of people give birth every day. So yeah, one percent I think of, of women who give birth actually get postnatal psychosis, and that and so it's a lot of people. It's a small percentage, but it's a lot of people. And and as I was reading, I thought, ah, oh, she's suffering from that. She's not. She genuinely isn't just heartless. She just can't cope. There's something broken there and and her only therapy is to spend all the money i think that's one of the strengths of lawrence's writing the fact that we've got this um psychological insight into the character um so he's describing something that is psychologically accurate he's not just Mm. throwing words down on the page so yeah he is giving us a very very realistic um view of this woman who's going against what society deems is proper and appropriate for a parent Yes. yes parents are supposed to love their children unconditionally and yeah when something like that gets broken in that case yeah we sort of like started worming our way down the rabbit hole to where the horror is going to come into this story i mean we've we've got that part as you say she's doing retail therapy to try and overcome this and you've got a house that's whispering um more money's needed there's not enough money yeah that's that's a that's a really weird point i loved it i loved it from an atmospheric point of view and i love the idea that the children were tuned into this and you kind of then have this idea is, is he is he referring to it in a literal sense as in the house is genuinely whispering this 
or it seems like every time they ask for anything, the first response is we haven't got enough money for it. So there's that. It's a beautiful. It's in a way. It's it's both a metaphor and a literal meaning at the same time, which is very clever. Very very yeah. clever. Yeah, I've got to admit that part is quite impressive. I think this is probably one of my favourite D.H. Lawrence stories. Um, so yeah, we've got um, we've got neglect in there, which yeah. is um, which is kind of a scary thing. Um, neglected children. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but none of us really wants to think about those and wants to um, deem neglect as being something acceptable um there's a faulty sense of values so hester makes the stylish living the chief goal of her marriage um consequently a relationship with husband and the care and nurture of her children uh, begin to stagnate and whenever money becomes available she spends beyond her means yes so image is very important to her and and again it goes down to exactly what you're saying at the start i think one of the one of the underlying themes of this story is be careful a, a, a bit like monkey's paws be careful what you wish for but also it is that where you have to ask how you earn your money and what do you earn your money for so if you earn your money because you want to live a comfortable life then fair enough but if you want to earn your you earn your money so that everybody else thinks you have a better life then that's questionable yeah yeah who are you actually earning it for are you earning yeah. it for yourself to have a better life or so that other people believe the charade. Yes. So that, uh, this was, is that probably, was really good. Uh, is this probably one of the latest stories, that we, most recent ones? I mean, it's 1926 when this one came out. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's close. I mean, it was... Um, Lovecraft, Demon, 1930. Demon Lover was the latest one, wasn't it? I think that was yes, uh, Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely more modern in that approach. Though it actually has an older feel. Where we were talking about uh, Pigeons from Hell... And I was saying yeah. how that had a really modern feel to it. I thought this one had an older feel. I thought it had the kind of feelings of something. I was, I, I, I will admit, I felt surprised when he got in a car. That's that was because of the way that he, his language that he was using, and the way he was talking about the society that she wanted to be known in. It sounded yes. more like the society around a picture of Dorian Gray type, Oscar Wilde type stuff than. You know this idea of, of getting in a car when he, when he got in a car when the uncle got his car I was like hang on the, the car and then i had to look up the year it was published it was really weird. it threw me a bit like that. a car who's driven here dr emmett brown yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was on, what, what i love the way the uncle just it's one of those where you get the the age from is is like i don't know how old the kid is how old the son is to be honest with you i got in my head when it starts off that he's about 10, which is that wonderful magical age, you know, when you start becoming sort of politically aware of, of your surroundings and then, but you also still want to believe in fairies. You don't want to take the risk of, you know, that, that stuff not being true. So I kind of got that idea um, of that's how old he was. And then he's, he's putting bets on by the gardener and, and the uncle comes along and finds out that the gardener is talking secretly to the son and put, and taking bets for him and put him money on and doesn't really think weird about it it's just like oh right okay so you are telling the truth well i'll put a bet on then <laughs> yeah the uncle i think is probably <laughs> he should be one of the most dangerous things in this story <laughs> the fact that he's got no consideration for what's morally or ethically acceptable just oh kids having a bet Go on, then I'll put a tenner on that one as well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to the races, little lad, yeah. Um, you've got to put a fiver on that. That's never got to win. Oh, yeah. go on then, yeah. Yeah, so, I, was yeah almost, I... I was almost going, because when he keeps saying, I started it all off with that 10 shillings you gave me. And it was like, I was expecting the uncle to go, oh, really, what was my money, was it? Well, I want 30%. <laughs> yeah, that would not have surprised me, yeah. No. Um, yeah, the, the uncle brilliant character because he's just so wrong on every level yet yeah. so credible because of that do you know what he reminded me of actually in as uh, i'm rubbish with names so please excuse me because i can't remember the actor but you know um uh, the mummy when the mummy came back in the 90s with brandon frazier yes as the lead 
and I can't remember the, the the love interest that he has, the woman that's in it, the librarian woman who's the, who's the most intelligent. Her brother, who all he's trying to do is find an artifact. Yes, that's another guy you mean. Yes, uncle reminds me of. He's kind of like a a bit of a cat. You know, he's got his car, he <laughs> goes to the races. You know, how are you doing, sis? That's that kind of. Oh, I'm going to have to find out who he was now. Yeah, he's it's, a, it's a great, he's a brilliant British actor as well, and I can't remember his name off the top of not my head. Hugh, it's not Hugh Laurie, is it? No. Uh, I think that's where I'm getting confused, because it's like, the actor is like a Hugh Laurie light, just like Brendan Fraser is like a Nathan Fillion light. Yes. And yeah, it's... Um, right, um, you, use, you use your powers of the internet tonight. Let me do um, right. She was called Rachel Wise or yeah, Vice. That's her. Yeah. She's brilliant in it as well. From Hannah. Yeah, John Hannah. John Hannah, that's it. Well, his his character in, in The Mummy, I think, reminds me of the uncle anyway, in that way. He was in four weddings as well. He was, yes. He's in, yeah. he's in quite a few. Th- he's one. He's one of those faces that when you see him, you kind of go, "Oh, isn't he in?" You know, "Oh, isn't he in?" And you know, the gentlest holistic detective agency too. Uh, yes. I'm trying to think which version he's in. Actually, Is it the latest ones. 2017 version. Yeah, that's the American ones. Nothing like the book, but absolutely brilliant. Thoroughly enjoyed them. Um, I've not watched any of them. Oh, they were oh, my favourite Douglas Adams. Not my your favourite. Favorite. No. Well, I mean, once you've read Hitchhikers, it's just a case of everything else that Douglas Adams has done after that isn't Hitchhikers. No. No, but Dirt Gently, I love Dirt Gently. The Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul, I think, is... It's just absolutely magnificent. And, has, and I love the fact that that's actually the book where he had a public, he had a date to be published and they put a PA in with him to live in his house to make sure he wrote it because he's so notorious for not doing it. And uh, it was actually the day that they were sending it to the printers that they went round his house to pick up the last chapter. And I love that. I just think, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what writing is, yes. Yeah. Being lazy and nearly missing deadlines. Yes, that's, that's Douglas Adams all over, isn't it? It's absolutely serious. Yeah. Um, and I think that's got one of my favourite pieces in it, actually, Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul, where um, there's an explosion at the airport. Yeah. And um, he says, um, and they blame the usual suspects of um, IRA terrorists and the gas board. But it was, yeah, it just is so droll and, yeah, yeah clever. I think you might need to go back to that, actually, because I think it's one of those, when you've left a, a period of time and go back and, and, and not read it very close to Hitchhikers and read it more on its own, it's a very, very funny character. It's a brilliant idea that, you know, you, you set yourself up as a detective and the crimes will just solve themselves <laughs> because you will find the clues because you're supposed to, because it's all connected. Love it. I think it's brilliant. Sorry. But yeah, I'm going to have to dip there. back into them. Um so, yeah, we've got a dead kid in this one, um, which um, I'm seeing dead children as a common theme in the stories that we're reading. I think we should be on registers somewhere, really, for this. You know, yeah, um, I've got a theory about that, actually. Go on. Uh, I don't know if it's theory or just a hypothesis. Could be any of them. It's not scientific, anyway. Um, it was... Um, child mortality was much higher back then in the Victorian times. And if you read about things like Charles Dickens... Um, and I'm trying to think of some of the others, and I think Stevenson as well. They all lost kids, and they all lost right. kids very early, you know, in young, uh, very young, and they all kind of ended up with the consumption is one of the words that was used back then. You know, they all had these childhood diseases that would take the lungs, or they, you know, they, they would seem to just sort of die of anxieties or whatever. So I think that played a lot into the, um, the schemata of the Victorian and Edwardian age. So, yeah, this is like it's a common theme. So um, nowadays, um, when we're seeing modern films coming out, 
um, and we're seeing people being terrorised by things on their phone. That's because we've got sort of like this whole relationship with phones and the dangers that they represent. So it's reflecting, um, it was reflecting the modernity of the time, yeah? Yes, that's what I think anyway. That makes perfect sense to me, yeah. Um, especially with child mortality, as you say, being quite high during these periods. And, and also I think... Down to pollution as well, wasn't it? There was a lot of people dying of basically because they didn't have good air. So kids were but they voted Tory as well. Yeah, well, it's, uh, actually, back then it was the Liberals. All right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the Liberals were all about industrial, res- you know, and factories and 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 having the rights to be able to produce things. The Conservatives back then were all about, oh no, we should we shouldn't have all this machinery and factories. We should go back to working the land. All these peasants should be actually peasants again and you know there should be a lord of the land and and everyone digs in the field and be agriculture and all one britain and it was the liberals that wanted the whole kind of like oh no let the people earn let the people make factories and don't care about the workers to be honest with you because as long as people earn money that's the way it should be done so all the pollution and everything like that to be honest is blaming the liberals (laughs) i'm happy to blame liberals for that yes and i'm happy to blame (laughs) tories for um everything else yes yeah absolutely Um, yeah Absolutely. The only reason the Labour Party existed was because the, the 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 Conservatives didn't care, and the Liberal Democrats did. You know, wanted the um, the business people to have all the power. So the Labour Party had to come along to stop all that going on. Basically, um, weird. It's weird how it all works so long ago. Yeah, it is, and yeah, weird how all of these things change. Right. Um, we are getting easily distracted this evening. I don't we? know why, because, we, I mean, it's a brilliant story. And I think yeah, it is. Talking about the end it of it. so many one. themes. Yeah, it does. And it's, it's, it's one of those ones that I, uh, I, this particular time, I got so much more out of reading it than hearing somebody else read it. Because when I heard somebody else read it, you kind of just got it on face. But when you're reading it yourself, you keep stopping and thinking about what's going on because you, you do get caught out by it. And, and because when you listen to someone read it, they've moved on to the next bit yeah. without a pause. When you read on this particular occasion, I think when you're reading it, when you first read that, the, the, the gardener's taking the bet when he, the way that the child, the way he writes the child talking about putting the first bet on, I actually found that so disturbing being a parent of a child that's like 13 because yeah. it sounded right yeah um well it sounded wrong but yeah, sounded, you know what i mean yeah, yeah. it's it, yeah. Was, it was wrong what was going on you know and but the dialogue was so believable it was just so matter of fact that it, i found that incredibly creepy in that not actually creepy is not the right word it was disturbing it was one of those moments where you sat there and went i know it was a different time but there are so many red flags popping up around the scenario that i i I wonder i wonder if it's one of those stories that actually has more scariness now than it did when it was originally published exactly what you're saying but also um We've got the the characters there. If Bassett hadn't been putting those bets on for him, in that case, his whole brush with the supernatural and his sacrifice that he's made in giving up his life would have been wasted. So this guy who could have been king of non-city um, <laughs> is, um, is one of the heroes of the story. He's the one who's able to transfer the... He's able to transfer Paul's supernatural ability into a financial outcome that can hopefully get Paul to buy the love that his mother isn't able to supply him. Mm. Yeah. So I get I get what you're saying. He's not a particularly good character, especially in our day and age where we sort of like worry about our children and we know that there are sort of like an awful lot of dangerous people out there. But... He's one of the good guys. I mean, he's even slightly better than Uncle Paul. Yeah, Sorry, oh, Uncle absolutely. I, think, um, I mean, the mother is obviously the, the villain, even though she's mentally ill. And therefore, yeah. 
is the Ministry of Responsibility. So therefore, you, you can put a lot of blame on the absent father, who seems to be a bit of a layabout and, and all that kind of stuff. But in which case, the, the ideal role models that should be coming in are the uncle. And the uncle is the one at that point. And however innocent it is, and you can have, you know, very, very innocent relationships of um, adults and children, which are really, really cool. They do become friends and they do help out in that way. But the uncle just doesn't seem to show any concern once he realises, you know, it's, it's, it's just one of those, oh, you're racing, are oh, you? Come with me then. You know, it's very... Um, he, in, in his own way, he is as ambivalent towards the child's feelings as the mother is. Absolutely. I mean, this is where, um, whenever I, as a child, received a financial gift from someone, it was because they didn't give two shits about me. And it was just sort of like, there you go, there's a couple of quid, happy birthday. Um, and yeah, it's the same here from this uncle. You know, yes. um, it's your birthday. There's a ten shilling no. Don't care what you're going to spend it on, whether it's sort of like hookers, blow, you know, whatever. You're ten years old. Hey, yeah, I remember days when you could take a ten shilling no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, but yeah, um, he's he's as neglectful and negligent and i suppose maybe that's where the horror comes from everybody is neglecting this child's real needs yes this i think actually that's where i find it's not the character of the gardener disturbing to be honest because he's actually he's not really doing much else he's just he's just talking to this lad because this lad wants someone to talk to and i think yeah. part of me thinks there's a certain amount of disturbing there because i think nowadays people like that who are actually just you know it's like kez isn't it you know, the yeah. story, I can't remember what the actual name of the book is called, but that's about a, a child that's got neglect and he's just trying to find a connection with someone. And this, this guy says, here, try a bird of prey. And it's that same type of thing that he's doing. And it's quite often, quite often the story would go against the gardener and like maybe wrongful accusations and, and that kind of thing. And it's not so much he's a bad character it's a bad situation i think is what i found disturbing i found it disturbing as if that gardener wasn't um as kind as he is in that particular point that child is so vulnerable in that moment that's that's what when i say it's, it's not the situation that was disturbing it was the child's dialogue it was the way he was talking it was the vulnerability that he builds into that one moment of going, well, can I put a bet on? And at that moment, that child is opening himself up. I mean, there's that moment, isn't there, where the uncle's kind of like, are you sure he's holding your money in account? You know, yeah. you do have that moment where you're thinking, oh, well, if he is, with... either the gardener's taking the money off and not putting any bets on, or the gardener's taking all the winnings and, and, he's, and the kid's not going to see any of them. So that's a really nice relief when you find out that all the money is actually there. And that, that's, that's absolutely right and, and and on the level but the moment when it happens is it is that and i think it is because of being a parent that you sort of like you look at it and you you have that sudden realization that your children are genuinely that vulnerable at times and you know and you and you don't know and you, you just have no concept of or even if you even if you are giving them all the love in the world there's still a moment where they just are so innocent in what they're asking and they don't understand the ways of the world at that moment. And, and I think that's what it was. That's why I found it disturbing. Yeah, I think it's I think it's definitely one of those stories that parents will find more disturbing than <laughs> people who bloody child dies at the end. Oh my god. I mean, he just oh I mean he dies just trying to please his mother. And the first line that comes out is, well, you got 80 grand. You know. Which, in fairness, that was a lot of money back in those days. It's a lot of money now, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's you know, a hell of a lot of money. It's 10% um, deposit on a then, house, I think, or something like that. Um, yeah, it's... Um, I mean, back then you could have sort of like bought half of Manchester for 80 grand, I think. Yeah, um, probably. Yeah, the good a half lot, as well, I'm lot, thinking. A lot of money. Um, so, um, one of the questions I wanted to ask is, is he lucky? He tells us that he's lucky... He wins all of these bets on the horses, which yes. would sort of like indicate some level of um, 
fortuitousness, but he does end up a little bit dead by the end of the story. But again, is that fortune? I mean, he's sort of like getting away from a mother that doesn't give two craps about him. Is he lucky? Um, what a very interesting question. And I never really thought of it. The reason know, being is because there's a couple of things about luck, isn't there? Because Darren Brown did that wonderful show about luck and how lucky people have a tendency to just see opportunity more rather than actually be lucky. You know, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. And the more you believe that you are lucky, the more you are. And, and like you're saying, is, is he actually tapping into the paranormal at that point? Or is he just going into such a deep meditation that he's able to actually do the maths and work out the best probable course? Because he doesn't pick the winner all the time. No, there he doesn't. times when he yeah. is absolutely certain. That's the, that's the difference in it, isn't it? And he drives himself basically insane in the pursuit of trying to find that. So I'm going to say, no, I don't think he was lucky. I think he lived a miserable existence, even in the point of trying to prove it. And even at the absolute end of it, all he was ever trying to do was prove that he was lucky and then never really did that. So he doesn't even get the gratification of his mum looking at him going, yes, you were lucky. Um, So you're basing luck on whether he's successful or not in winning his mother's... um... His mother's adoration. Um, I mean, yeah, it's an no. interesting little rabbit yes. hole. That I'm... <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Um, it's a fucking story, Ashley. Piss off. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no, no. It's gone. <laughs> um, yeah, it was just. Um, yeah, it was just one of those things where there's just such a dichotomy where we're sort of like presented with this child that wants to be lucky and who develops this ability which we would ordinarily perceive as my god lucky bastard he knows what the winners are going to be um and yeah at the end of it he's been lucky enough to win 80 grand which then and now a lot of money but slightly dead and still not getting his mother's affection and to be fair and i think this is where again uh, the lovely in the lovely layers underneath it is no no he's not lucky in what he does he works extremely hard for that money you know, that rocking horse does not ride itself. He he, you know, he has to get on that thing and he drives himself into the ground, almost as a, as a metaphor for being, you know, a businessman in that respect, where if you're trying to earn all this money, you are neglecting your kids, you are neglecting your life because you are putting so much dedication into doing the one thing, which is usually screwing over your workers, to make that extra money that nobody's ever really going to appreciate because of everything you're doing into it. So I think there's a lot of that in there as well. Because he doesn't, he, he, he doesn't, he's not just lucky. He's not randomly picking things. He is working hard on that horse to get to that point where he can find that information. So no, I, I, I'll go with my first view on that one in that he, had, he does work extremely hard. That he drives himself, to, he kills himself in his pursuit of it. Similar question. Um, Hester describes herself as being unlucky at the start because she's married somebody who is um, not particularly lucky. Yes. Do we think she is unlucky? Because by the end of the story, she's um, 80 grand up on the deal. She's managed to get the house refurbished and um, buy things so that she looks like she's affluent. And she's managed to get rid of an annoying kid that she wasn't really that troubled about in the first place. And again, I'm going to say, no, she isn't lucky. I think her pursuit of everything on that is related to like a mental illness. And it's that whole kind of thing of she sees luck as the reason that people are rich. So she blames this kind of strange force that nobody can really describe as the reason for her misfortune or her lack of having it as the reason for her misfortune. And, and But all the way through, even when she does get the money, when he does feed her £3,000 surreptitiously through a solicitor. Um, Which all 10-year-olds have, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's just one of those. One of those and, she, and even then, when she gets given the money of £1,000 to start with, and then she, she wants more. She actually wants all of it at that point. Yeah. And so I don't think she is lucky in that way. I think she, again, she's somebody else. That's, that's the, the root of her own downfall in the, um, in the way that it is. I think it's, the whole thing is, is nobody, out of all of it, 
nobody's really i think the only one who's really lucky out of it is probably the gardener because he's made a few quid on his way and he had a friend you know but he's lost his friend but he's the you know he's the only one that seems to if you're going to use that definition of luck i think i actually think the whole i think part of it is the idea that there isn't in this particular story there is no luck there is only the perception I suppose it's of because luck. luck's not particularly well defined in this story is it um, no. and the original associations that we have with it are luck and money i mean we've even got the luck and lucre association being sort of like foregrounded there and yeah luck um is meant to be um financial wealth financial security um financial benefits whereas the reality is i think personally i feel at my most fortunate not out of anything that's got to do with finances yeah. but it's sort of like um yeah it's through friendships it's through meetings of minds it's yeah. through circumstances landing in a particular felicitous way it's if you perceive luck to be purely about finances in that case you're always going to be disappointed yes yeah um, I mean, these people that say money can't buy you happiness, I think are talking out their arse because I think money does buy you happiness. But I think luck and money are two different things. I think I think money doesn't buy you happiness, but it buys you the ability to be happy. So I think, I think just, it, just having money, unless you are some sort of I don't I don't coinophile or something like that. I don't know what the love of money would be called, probably ecophile or something, uh, economophile. Um, Unless that's the thing, unless you get absolute genuine joy out of looking at large piles of printed paper, which effectively is what it is, or big numbers on a screen, then it, the money itself does not buy you happiness. But it does actually give you the ability to have the options to go out and do the stuff that does make you happy. Which, it yeah, pays for the hookers and blow, which, um, yeah, yeah which I is don't think... Always a benefit. Yeah, um, because if you don't pay for the hookers and blow, in that case, um, yeah... Exactly. Somebody's going to end up unhappy, yeah. I mean, ask, all you've got to do is ask Hugh Grant whether or not he was unhappy. Yes. Uh, yeah, I must. We'll, we'll invite him in um, one week. Um, <laughs> see if he... The hookers yeah. and blow, Hugh. Hookers and blow. Did that make you happy? <laughs> um, so, uh, do you, uh, yes, so... Um, <laughs> Loved it, yeah. And, and actually, I'll tell you what, one of the other things I really, really liked about this, because, you know, part of the part of what we talk about is is inspirations and how these things come about and how you do that sort of stuff. And I've got to say, with absolute honesty, I don't think I would have thought of creating that story the way that he did, of a child getting on a rocking horse and riding it like absolute mad to be able to then visualize the winners of horse racing that I, I don't, I, I actually find it difficult to imagine how he came up with that idea, which is a really lovely thing to have. Cause normally I can quite, I might be wrong, but I can usually come up with some sort of idea of how he may have done it. But that mechanism of getting on a rocking horse to find the winners of the horse races it's really, it's a very, very bizarre link. Even though there's a, there's an obvious literal link, horse, horse racing, but to ride, to ride your rocking horse, to get to the place of luck, to find the winner of the horse races, because that gets you money. That's that. I think that's an amazing piece of creativity right there. Stephen King does something similar in um, Needful Things, where one of the um, pieces that are actually bought from the antique shop is a, um, do you remember Escalado? Yes. Um, it's like an Escalado type game where, you, game where you've got horses that are meant to sort of like go around. That's right, yes. And you get the um, the guy who's got the game um, reads the running order from a horse race um, and ascribes a number to each one of the horses that are on there, runs the thing, and that gives him the order of um, who's going to win and who's going to lose in the particular race which i can sort of like see that and yeah i get what you're saying i think that with the escalado type game is a lot closer to something that you could think oh yeah yes I can imagine if he was getting on the horse and saying to himself i'm riding in the derby and then rides the horse and then gets off the horse and then asks him wins the race and then gets off and asks the horse what your name is 
and he gives him the name and that turns out to be the winner that I can make the connection very, you know, I, and, and I thought that's what it was going to be actually when, from the name, the rocking horse winner, that's exactly where my mind went to of, Oh, you run the race and then you ask the horse and it tells you, but, I, and, but he wasn't, he, he rides off to the place called luck and goes into a trance like state where he's just given the, uh, that, that's that that's level you know on the meditation side of things it's, i think it's an amazing leap the way that he does it and it doesn't and it doesn't sound really convoluted either in the way that it happens it's just it's so matter of fact and so believable because of it because he's we've all witnessed kids going mental on some sort of apparatus <laughs> yeah know? um yeah they do don't they? they get obsessed with things and yeah it's so easy i mean you were saying earlier that it's almost a humorous image where we've got something like the child rocking away. Um, and yet yeah, it's something that we've seen again and again with kids obsessing over a particular toy. Um, but this one is just obsessing to make the family 80 grand better off, which I think, why can't we all have kids like that? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a certain element of that, isn't there? You know, I mean, it's a good, you know... I mean, obviously, the death at the end is a little bit unfortunate and probably not what we'll be wishing for, but... Uh, Maybe yeah. that's just what the publisher was asking for. You know, yeah. In his, in his original tale, it didn't end like that. He actually ended up starting an entire empire. Maybe having some merchandise, you know, some T-shirts printed up with, you know, Rocking Horse winner on it and a little plush Rocking Horse and stuff like that. And went, which oh, were please. not delivered by DHL, yeah. Which were, they were um, not delivered, no. DHL delivered a dead child. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think we can say that with all honesty as well. But yeah. How, how ahead of his time was he? You know, there's this this kid is making huge amounts of money of playing with his kids' toys, and now we have kids playing computer games and making money on Twitch and being professional. You know, out of playing with kids' toys, I think DH was ahead of his time. He really was, and did ladies chattel his lover? He's got sort of like people banging um, surreptitiously. Um, and yeah, shaggy miners um, with an E, not an O. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, so basically, he was so he, he has them fucking miners. So he predicted Margaret Thatcher. Yes. Yeah. Which, um, if I'd known that's what he was predicting, we could have sort of like burnt her at the stake before she <laughs> started to do any damage, really, couldn't we? Yes. You so, enjoyed that one then. Yeah, I did. And, and I've got to say, it, it was out of all the ones we've read so far. Um, and we've read some absolute corkers and we've read some that you've really got to dig deep into understanding things. I think this one has had the most layers of, yeah. of so many different I ideas and um, I suppose the word I'm looking for is metaphors. It's just layers and layers and layers of metaphors of life, of society, of growing up, of parenting, of, of capitalism, you know, of, of class. Because the class is all there as well. You can do a Marxist reading of this. You can do post-colonial readings and feminist readings of this all the way through. And what is essentially, what is it, 2,000 words? Um, yeah, it was, um, yeah, 13 Amazing. pages. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing to, to think of it like that. And, and as far as the quality goes, like I say, yes, I think it is dated in the way that it's written in comparison to, say, The Pigeons from Hell. Um, it's not as, I don't think it's as, as um, reward, instantly rewarding, you know, like candy, as something like The Monkey's Paw, because Monkey's Paw, I think, gives you this really great instant gratification. Yeah. Um, and but it's equally as deep as things like the demon lover and um, I think the nurses, the old nurses story as well, that had a certain lay, you know, certain political uh, ideas underneath what was going on all the way through. So I, 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 it was a combination of all of them. I would have to actually, as a as a piece of study, I think it is up there, really, really up there. It might not be the most instantly enjoyable one, as in you know when you're reading the story, but underneath it, all the way through, it is definitely up there with one of the most the cleverest ones we've seen. 
so far? I think, yeah, if we were going to sort of like rank them like that, I think you're absolutely right. Monkey's Paw would be right at the top of the list because yeah. it's got the atmosphere, it's got that immediate turnaround. You get to the end and you think, oh, my God, that was just so tightly wound uh, and still nothing has actually happened in there. Yeah. So, yeah, love the Monkey's Paw for that. Um, but, yeah, I do think it's up there. What have you yeah. got for us for next week? Uh, well, next week, I thought... Um... We would go, and let me just pull it up here, because I, I have it here. Um, we're going to go for a bit of Charles Dickens and The Signal Man. Oh, yes, brilliant. Dickens and The Signal Man. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, um... Good, because um, there's something I want to do with Dickens as well before the end of the year. But, uh, yeah, I think that ties in nicely. Brilliant. Yeah, Absolutely. excellent stuff. So, so that's what we're doing. Uh, so we're going to read that one for, for next week. I'm hoping next week we'll have an announcement, but we'll see. Fantastic. Um, anybody who's still lurking here, please hit those like buttons, hit the subscribe buttons, hit for notifications, whatever. Just, just keep slapping your computer and, thing. Yeah. And share it. We got a subscriber this week. It was quite it was quite funny. I happened to share it with someone because they were talking about a book. I went, oh, we discussed that. <laughs> it was it was it was Jekyll and Hyde, funny enough. Which All right. we, ever since we've read that, Jekyll and Hyde has been haunting me everywhere I go. Um, <laughs> it's even on Fortnite. It came up on Fortnite. It's like, oh, what? Um uh, anyway, there was sort of say, and I put I sent them the link and then they came back and they went, that was great. <laughs> that, was, that was really and it surprises people that they really enjoying this and i love the fact that people are enjoying this and i like i like to be giving to people well, that way and, and i love that that uh, you guys out there are enjoying this um so if, if you enjoy it do tell others to to get involved and do make suggestions um i think we've actually done really well tonight i think we've broken a record of not doing a knob gag oh shit yeah um yeah. And there's so many sort of like hung like a horse and sort of like yeah, yeah there we could so have gone many... all over the place with riding yeah. and rocking horse like Andrew you know we could have yeah. done all sorts of different we could have gone so many different places um but uh, so I think we've got um, some sort of record out of that one tonight because it, it's just but, so, it was so deep there you go um, I was to get that one week, in as well next week it's about Dickens and yeah yes yeah it's been a long time since I've been to one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's that's great so basically uh join us again next week hopefully and smash those buttons and share it and like it and bells and all that kind of malarkey and i'll get the links going uh so find me on facebook books of colin davis and dm me first five get a free kindle copy of blood ink and then when and we hit 30 board. subscribers we'll do the same type of thing for ash who will then give away links to an audiobook yeah definitely yes brilliant well, that's Thank great. You all. Thank you very much. And I'll we'll see you next week. Bye. Yeah, fan.